cracked a tooth earlier so uh so i'm not i'm not doing much talking um yes uh i it will either have been first world war um lab or cell or probably uh or it might have been a uh, napoleonics so badahoff and um and uh brilliant. waterloo brilliant i'll try not to feel intimidated that you're here on the call <laughs> we're all friends aren't we there we go right brilliant okay um well let's do share screen and let's do that uh there we go. James, would you like to just reassure me that you can see a dog? Brilliant. Right. OK. Hello, everyone. Looking forward to this. It's a talk I've done a couple of times before. Um, a few little asides here. I am a dog owner and uh, the Red Baron gives me the opportunity to put some dogs in and so on. And, and for, for the younger that's with, youngster that's with <laughs> Matt, uh, you'll see that the, the redness of Rick Tofen comes quite late in his life. I was actually surprised how few aeroplanes he flew painted red, but I'm sure the little lad won't be too upset about that. Right. Okay. Uh, somehow I'm going to try and get this all in within an hour. <laughs> and we may even have time for questions. Um, so Manfred von Richthofen, possibly, possibly the most famous aviator of World War I, certainly internationally famous and features in popular culture as we will see. Very famous photograph of the gentleman. <laughs> and um, we can see that, uh, uh, it, we, what we're looking at there, we're, we're looking at someone who's German, who's, who's someone with a German identity, Prussian, uh, as we will see, um, a highly esteemed hero, certainly a hero amongst the Germans and respected by the allies. But why is he a hero? What is he known for? Well, in actual fact, he's a serial killer and determined cold-blooded murderer. That's what he's famous for. He's famous for shooting other aeroplanes out of the sky and, and killing people. And so we tend not to make heroes of, of serial killers must be for, uh, but otherwise. Anyway, Richthofen intrigues me. He's, he's one of these people who is in a class of, of, I use the term, the noble enemy. So um, I'm a, a Napoleonic enthusiast. I, I remember the Badahoff tour, Gareth, it was great. Um, so Michael Ney, I, I'm a great admirer of Michael Ney, uh, who fought alongside Bonaparte and arguably lost the Battle of Waterloo, but that's for another story. Um, and Erwin Rommel on the right, uh, who had the, the good sense to be involved in the, the plot to assassinate Hitler. Uh, so both the gentlemen on either side of Richthofen are enemies of Britain, but they are people that we admire, uh, as is the Red Baron. And popular culture. Um, so the Red Baron, uh, very famous because of Snoopy. And we will come back to Snoopy towards the end of the tour. Um, and also in the in the USA, there is a brand of pizza, Red Baron Pizza. I've talked to friends in the USA and they say, actually, it's a very popular brand of pizza. So if the Red Baron can help you to sell pizza, it can't be bad. Right. What are you going to get tonight? I'm going to tell you the story of Manfred von Richthofen. That's what you were expecting. But as a, a lead into that, I'm going to give you an overview of flying in World War I because I, I don't want to just come to Richthofen cold. I think the whole story of flying in World War I is fascinating and it's very rapid technological development. Also, as I've mentioned, I'm a bit keen on dogs and there's at least two different dogs here. See how many you can spot. Uh, so the Richthofen family. Richthofen comes from a noble family or well, minor nobility. Uh, so that they're there, they come from Silesia, which later became part of Poland. Um, there's the family coat of arms. And uh, they part, some of the members of the family are involved in the judicial system. Uh, so um, you can see on the, on, the, um, uh, on the coat of arms there, the judge there. So a Richter in German uh, is a judge. So I think that's part of where the family name comes from. Um, and if we look at uh, Richthofen's background, Manfred's background, so 
of course, the borders were different in those days. Germany, or the modern Germany, became Germany in 1871. Um, that was part of, of what's now Poland. So he was, he was born in Lower Silesia, a little place, Kleinberg. It's now part of Rocklau, uh, I hope that's pronounced correctly, prominent Prussian aristocratic family. So he's a von Richthofen, he's from nobility. His dad is, uh, is in the army, Major Albrecht, uh, and his mother was Kuning, Kunigunde von Schickfussen Neudorf, again, noble family. He had two oldest, he had an elder sister, Ilse, and two younger brothers, um, whose names I wrote down and then I put to one side, how annoying. Uh, but they, they both get name checked later in the story. Uh, one of them flies with him. And there's his pho a photograph of him aged seven years old. Now, he, the war kicks off 1914, as we know, and Richthofen Manfred wants to be involved in the fighting. And he wants to, he wants to be invited, he wants to know uh, if he can, um, he, he, he wants to play an interesting part. He wants to join in the excitement. He wants to be a cavalry officer. And so he's a, a lancer. This is Ulan cavalry. You can see this rather smart uniform. The, the chaps are distinctive of the, the, the lancer units. And um, he, he serves in the cavalry on both the Eastern Front and the Western Front. There's a bit more mounted activity on the Eastern Front, uh, certainly after 1914. Uh, so he was in Russia, he was in France, he was in Belgium. But he, get, he kind of gets sidelined. He gets into some logistics work. He's, be, he's involved in sorting out supplies. Now, supplies are very important, but he wanted to be at the front line. He wanted to be killing the enemy. Um, and um, so he, he gets a bit stuck as a, looking after the transport systems. And he's on record as saying, I have not gone to war in order to collect cheese and eggs. I've gone to war for another purpose. That's, that's part of his application for transfer. So he gets to join the flying service. Now, this is new. Flying is a very new thing. Um, so June to August 1915, he's an observer on reconnaissance missions over the Eastern Front. August 1915, goes to Belgium. He transfers to a flying unit in Ostend. Uh, now, it is, it is believed that as, as an observer, i.e., um, the the observer the rear gunner uh, behind the pilot he it's it's believed that he actually shot someone down um over the french lines it was a french farm and that's the french farm and airplane there in the bottom right however the airplane fell over allied lines the germans couldn't confirm the kill so he didn't get that uh, that that wasn't recorded in his favor uh, as you may know he ends up with uh, a score of 80 kills um, but his scoring hasn't started yet. It's the highest scoring ace in World War One. So what about aeroplanes in World War One? Part one of this section. Big question, what was the prime use of aeroplanes in World War One? And that poster there, rather fanciful picture of, of aeroplanes. They don't look very accurate to me. They're a little bit, a bit bendy. I think this is, this is the kind of early romanticized idea of aeroplanes. What was artillery good for? Well, artillery was really, the real importance was reconnaissance because what does most of the killing in World War I? Well, that's artillery. Now you'll hear different people give different figures, but the one I've gone for, a nice simple figure, about 70% of casualties in World War I are from artillery. So for, for artillery to know where it's firing, to, to know what, where the targets are, uh, you might have the benefit of high ground, and if you, if you haven't, you're struggling for other means. And um, aeroplanes taking photographs are a very useful way of identifying where the targets are in the enemy lines so you can then concentrate your artillery upon them. Uh, those guns are eight, eight inch British howitzers. Now, I wanted to give a, a little brief introduction into the, the development of, of flying in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and uh, I recently paid a visit to the A.V. Rowe Museum, the Avro Museum, which is near me in South Manchester. Um, 
So I'm just using some photographs that I, I, I got from there just to show the rapid development of flying machines. Uh, so I'm using um, Rose uh, machines here. So July 1909, Rowe did his Type 1 triplane. You can see it there, top left. Uh, if I did, there go, there's a red marker. And that flew all of 300 feet. This is 1909, it gets 300 feet. March 1910, he's got another version of a triplane. April 1912, he's trying a monoplane. Uh, we've had one like this in the Museum of Manchester. And then 1912, he's on a Type G. So each each progressive type is looking more like the standard aeroplane that we see in World War I. But by the time World War I starts off, we've got some, um, we've got some basic aeroplanes. I have great admiration for any pilot who, who was prepared to fly in World War I because uh, those aeroplanes just look like so many bits of, bits of wood and canvas thrown together. Um, I, I think they're just tremendously brave. So there we have um, a Vickers gun buzz. Um, hello, Matt. Good to see. You. Well, Matt's youngster. Hello there. Good to see you, young man. Um, uh, and uh, this is an early pusher type. What do we mean by a pusher? We mean that the propeller is behind, so the propeller is pushing it along, rather than uh, rather the propeller being at the front pulling it along. That means you can put a machine gun at the front and you're not going to shoot off your propeller, which was the big problem for World War I. Uh, this particular type of aeroplane, it looks rather primitive, doesn't it? Um, that's operated by the British from July 1914 all the way through to 1916, when we start getting some, some aeroplanes together that look a bit more substantial, things like the Camel and the SE-5, which we will see later. Uh, by the end of the war, uh, aeroplane technology has developed enormously. Um, and uh, you know, they say you shouldn't have favourites, but I have a favourite World War I aeroplane. And for me, it's the Fokker D7, uh, which I think is a beautiful looking aeroplane. When I was a war gamer at secondary school, this is the aeroplane that I wanted to fly. Um, and I think that's a beautiful aeroplane. But you know, just, just look at how, how attractive that is, how substantial it is. It, it's not quite as gorgeous as the Spitfire yet, but it's on the way. And then pioneers in aerial warfare. I won't spend any great length of time on this slide, but you could see here from 1914 through to 1915, various firsts, the first dogfight of the war in 1914, um, the first use of machine guns to shoot another airplane out in the sky and so on. It's all very, very new. Uh, and um, we, have, we have the mention there at the bottom of the first German ace, a fellow called Oswald Wilke. We'll talk about him more in a moment. The big problem with an aeroplane is that if you've got a single seat aeroplane, your pilot is very busy directing the aeroplane, working out how to fly it. He might be looking out to do some observation. It helps if you've got a second guy to do that. And if he's going to be shooting at someone, how on earth can he shoot at anyone? If he's got a propeller in front of it, he's going to shoot his propeller off. That's a problem. Shooting through the air screw, shooting through the line of the propeller is a big challenge. So Roland Garros, this French gentleman, you can see here, his idea was, well, I want to do that. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to protect my propeller by putting steel plates in front of it, put triangular steel plates in front of the propeller so that when the bullets hit the propeller, they're hitting a steel plate and the the de propeller is defended. It's a bit rudimentary. It did work after a fashion. There we see his propeller on the right with the bullet deflectors um, because he actually had a, a bit of a problem with that and he damaged his own propeller and his aeroplane fell out of the sky, but he survived that one. Uh, Synchronisation is even cleverer. Uh, the French were trying to develop this. This is a guy called Saulnier. He's, he's put in a patent in 1914 to interrupt the, uh, the gun as it's firing through the arc of the propeller at the front. However, the guy that really fixed the problem, there was a Swiss guy called Schneider, interrupt a gear, 
so that, uh, that they had this particular mechanism so that when, for the moment that the propeller was in front of the machine gun, the machine gun would be stopped from firing. It was interrupted, an interrupter gear or a synchronizer gear. Now, um, a fellow called Tony Fokker, who was a Dutch guy who produced a lot of the airplanes used by the Germans and beautiful airplanes, um, he used this mechanism. Unfortunately, he wasn't very good at paying Schneider for the, the privilege of using it. So there, there was, uh, uh, he did get sued for patent infringement later. So here we have a classic German aeroplane. This is the Fokker Eindecker, which means Fokker one deck or Fokker one wing monoplane. And there was a period known as the Fokker Scourge when the Germans had these good aeroplanes up in the sky in 1915 into 1916. They were dominating the skies. And we are going to get back to Richthofen soon. Uh, but first of all, we're going to talk about some of the early German aces because we have to start somewhere. Max Immelmann, one of the earliest aces, known as the Eagle of Lille. That was where he operated from. Uh, and again, the first German ace um, and he's using the, the Fokker Eindecker. Uh, he's very famous for developing the Immelmann turn, which is a brilliant maneuver if you're a, a pilot. So you're flying one way and you quickly want to turn to fly back the way you came so that you could escape from an enemy or whatever. And you do it by both uh, turning your machine, flying your machine upwards and then turning it. And so and you basically do a, a flop. Kind of flop, a bit like a Fosbury flop for the, the high jump, if anyone knows about that. Um, so that's an extraordinary thing. So Max Immelman, he was he was very early on developing uh, early tactics, but uh, he came a cropper with his forward firing machine gun because he, he shot through his propeller, he was too high up and he couldn't recover, uh, and he was killed in the crash. Now, the guy coming alongside him was a fellow called Oswald Bölker, and he's the next great German air ace. And he's the father of air fighting tactics. And he literally wrote the book. He wrote the book, This is How You Fly as uh, a Combat Pilot. And he's the guy that Richthofen learned from. Uh, and there we see a rather nice model of an albatross down there, D2 albatross which is a, a plane that Richthofen himself flew. Alongside Richthofen, there's a guy called Burma, who was uh, a colleague of Richthofen. And these two guys get, got signed up together by Bölke. So they, they met, uh, they had a chance meeting, I think it was on a train, and they were talking. And Bölke could see that Richthofen and Burma would, would make really good pilots. So he took them, took them on and brought them into his his flying unit. Uh, Manfred himself managed to pull his brother Luther uh, from uh, a job in training and got him involved in flying as well. So uh, in uh, 1916, uh, Manfred joins number two bomber squadron and flies a two-seater albatross. So here we have this a two-seater albatross it's a bomber, so it's slightly bigger than a, than a fighter plane. Uh, and at this stage, he's a below average pilot. Oh, I thought he was the best pilot in all of them. Well, 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 he was, arguably, but he had, took it to go on learning. Now, James knows that I'm a bit enthusiastic about Verdun. And I'm delighted to share, well, I think it's very interesting, that arguably, um, Rick Tofen's first kill as a combat pilot was that he shot down a Newport over Verdun, actually over Fort Duomont, um, which is the central fort at Verdun. James and I will be, be there in May on the tour. You can ask James about joining the tour. It'd be lovely to see you there. Um, however, he didn't get the credit for shooting him down. It wasn't very well recorded. So although he scores 80 kills by the end of the war, well, but by the time he's killed, he doesn't get a credit for this one. So what is his first aeroplane? And he's not yet flying red aeroplanes. It takes a while before he gets the red paint, paint pot out. 
Um, so this first plane as a pilot, first fighter plane, is the Albatross D2. There you can see it. Looks a bit like a kind of fish, really, isn't that shape? But yeah, it's rather attractive. Um, and so August 1916, Rick Tofen is flying these aeroplanes. Uh, armed with two big hefty machine guns, two Spandaus, 500 rounds per barrel. Germ the Germans had pairs of machine guns. They were doing a fair bit of damage when they hit. A lot of the Allied pilots were only firing single machine guns at this stage. So if they did get a hit, it wasn't doing quite so much damage. Of course, the whole trick is to fly up behind the other guy. And this is how Rick Tofen gets a lot of his kills. So his very first confirmed kill, 17th of September, 1916, he's flying the Albatross D2 and he knocks down one of these FE2Bs. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, it's my first confirmed, I honored the falling enemy by placing a stone on his beautiful grave. Odd way of thinking about things. And he goes to a jeweler in Berlin and orders a silver cup. He wants to commemorate each of his kills with a silver cup. And he ended up with 60 of them. And after he got 60, they ran out of silver in Berlin. And he wasn't prepared to accept cups made out of a, a less valuable metal. So he only got 60 of them, although he gets another 20 kills. FE2B stands for Farmal, Farman Experimental Type 2. Again, it's a pusher aircraft, the pilots, uh, well, pilot, I, I think, yeah, I put them in the photo coming. Um, and there's there's another photograph of an FE2B. Now, um, I'm I'm not a terribly brave gentleman. I certainly would be wary about being either the pilot or the or the observer in this aeroplane. But can you imagine standing up to fire backwards on the rear mounted aeroplane? This thing's going through the air, bumping along, and you've got some crazy German shooting at you as well. Oh, and they didn't have parachutes. They're very brave guys. Uh, now, back to Oswald Bölker. So if, if you remember, he literally wrote the book. He wrote, this is how you do combat flying. Uh, and uh, they were involved in a, in a, a dogfight in October 1916. Um, and Rick Hofen was involved in this, this dogfight as well. He was, he was in that unit. Um, Unfortunately, Burma's aircraft catches Bölker's aircraft and damages the wing. And tragically, with the damaged wing, the aircraft uh, plummets towards the ground. He can't recover it, uh, and he's, uh, Bölker is killed. So, so they're now short of a leader for, um, the, for the German hunting squadrons. Now, one of the... Richthofen's most famous victims, 23rd of November 1916, is up against this gentleman, Major Lano Hawker, who actually has the Victoria Cross. I think they have brilliant names in World War I. Um, now, Hawker has been a great pilot. Uh, again, he has a fairly fundamental basic aeroplane, the, the, the DH2, you can see the photograph there. And, um, they are engaged in a dogfight. They're very closely matched. The two aeroplanes, there's very little between them. Uh, so they're circling one another, trying to take a pot shot at one another. Unfortunately, Hawker is running low on fuel. He has to go, he has to head back home, head back to the aircraft, to the airfield. At this point, Richthofen is able to get behind him, shot him down. So that's the 11th kill. So Richthofen ends up with 80 kills. We're only on 11 so far. And I've got about 30 minutes to get through the rest. Uh, now, January 1917, that he had damage to his aeroplane, so he, he uses a Halberstadt D2 for a short while. And while he's using this aircraft, Rick Tofen is fighting with some FE8. So that's a photograph on the top right there. Just, there, we go, that one there. That's an FE8. And Rick Tofen's aeroplane is shot through the fuel tank. So um, it, the fuel's running out. Rick Tofen's got to crash land fairly early uh, in order to, to survive and fly another day. 
and so Richthofen is shot out of the sky on this occasion, January 1917. Uh, so no, March uh, is when he's shot down by Edwin Bembo. That's Edwin Bembo on the right there. So uh, arguably, Richthofen only actually gets shot down three times, uh, and this is I, this is moment number one. What do we know about Richthofen as a person? Well, we've talked about his aristocratic background, so he came from a noble family. He enjoyed hunting with a rifle from an early age, so he knows about going into the forest, so he's going to the family forest, he would shoot deer or whatever, and so he knows about creeping up quietly on animals, patiently taking the shot, being very careful. One shot to kill your, your victim, because if you shoot and miss, then they, they'll run off. So all these tactics he's using as a pilot, try and get behind, try and sneak up, try and get up so the other guy hasn't seen you and you've shot him before he can respond. All these skills that he's learned. Now he did have a dog, a dog called Moritz, a photograph of him. As a senior officer, he was quiet. He was a little bit detached. It's, you know, it's, it's a difficult job leading a squadron. He did go and drink beer socially with his men, but he didn't stay up all night. He went to bed at a good time so he could be ready early. He could get up early for dawn patrol. Um, he was serious and competitive, took the job very, very seriously. And we, we know about his little silver cups. He enjoyed his fame. He liked all these people admiring him, but we don't think he had any romance. There's no documentation that there was any special lady in his life. Although I'm sure a lot of ladies admired him greatly. Now, here's his dog. Can you see that huge big thing in the photograph on the right? This is Moritz. It's a Great Dane dog and he bought him from a, a, far, a farmer in Flanders. And he wrote himself, the most beautiful creature ever creatured, ever, ever created. He's my little lap dog. Blimey. Wouldn't fancy that dog sitting on my lap. It's huge. Um, he slept in bed with me. <laughs> he slept on the bed with me. Can you believe it? I even took him up in the aeroplane once. He was very sensible and looked at the world with interest. Anyway. So the dog would come with him on social outings and he'd often share a beer with the dog. So there we go. So Richthofen was a dog lover. So it can't be all that bad, can you? Um, just to throw in yet another dog. Uh, this is a dog that's in the RAF Museum, a little tiny glass mascot that uh, Richthofen owned. But it's just me putting it in a gratuitous picture with a dog in it. Now, Richthofen was very keen to get the highest award possible, which is known as, its popular name was the Blue Max. It's known as the Paul Le Marais for merit, which is, the uh, the wording on the medal. So our highest medal is the, is the Victoria Cross. For the Germans, it was the um, the Paul of Marais. In order to get that medal, you had to you had to shoot down sixteen enemies. Any plane, you had to have it properly recorded. So so you didn't just have to shoot down sixteen. They had to be observed and confirmed. Um, this is his trophy room back home at his mum's house. Whenever he shot down an aeroplane, if he was shot down over German lines, and of course the British needed to be on the offensive, so they were generally flying over the German lines, so a lot of the aeroplanes fell down in British lines, he would then commandeer a, a car to go to visit the wreckage. Maybe even the, the, the pilots, the, the observers had survived, so he would meet them. And he was very keen to get souvenirs. So you see all the serial numbers here from the aeroplanes. Uh, you can see his photo in the middle there. Uh, and if you look at the top at the, uh, he's even got a, a, uh, an engine there, a rotary engine uh, for, uh, for his, his said candelabra. So, so we knew he liked to keep trophies. So we're getting through now to January, 1917. Early 1917 was a good time for the German air service. Uh, he's now moved on to another aeroplane, the Albatross <laughs> D3. And this is the first aeroplane that he paints red. Um, 
and so he's got a reputation. People have seen that he's flying over the, the Western Front and he's painted his, painted his aeroplane red. So he's very distinctive. People will know he's the red flyer or he writes the book, Die Rote Kampfflieger, the red battle flyer. And why has he done it? He wants to be recognized. We're not talking about camouflage in these days. He wants everyone to know it's him. And the other guys in his squadron paint their airplanes mostly red, but distinct. His is all red, the others are red and a bit, of, so you can tell them apart. Um, Albatross D3, great airplane for its time. Uh, and uh, this is the airplane that's dominating the skies in 1917. It's known, known as Bloody April, um, various reasons for that. The simple version is the Germans had better aeroplanes in the sky and the Allies were struggling with to have aeroplanes that were as good, but it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, so here we see Richthofen's squadron. It's a pity they didn't have colour photography in those days. There's probably a colourised version of this somewhere. Richthofen himself shoots down 22 British aircraft in April 1917. One day, he actually shot down four in one day. And he, his official tally gets up to 52. So that's that's more than anyone else at this stage. Uh, and there we have a rather lovely model um, of Rick Tofen with the red arrow. And now it's the Albatross D5. So the Albatross company are producing new versions of their aeroplanes. And once they're confident the aeroplane is a good design, Who's the first to get it? It's Richthofen. We'll give him, and that's good for publicity as well. Richthofen is really good for the German war effort. His picture is, is on the front page of lots of newspapers. Every time he shoots down another Allied aeroplane, it's big news in Germany. Haven't we got the best flyers ever? Ooh, yeah. Hooray for the Reich and all that. Um, and there we have just a, another classic picture of uh, the, uh, the, the red albatross flown by Richthofen uh, shooting down uh, a British aeroplane. <coughs> <coughs> At this point, we're going to talk a little bit more about aeroplanes, but note that Richthofen only ever operated in the British sector. He, only, he was only ever up against the Royal Flying Corps, which in April 1918 <coughs> was to the RAF. Um, so all the all the aeroplanes that he shot down were British or Commonwealth aeroplanes, so Australians, Canadians, and, and British. Uh, two aeroplanes there, you may recognise them. Um, we'll go, go for the bottom one first, the, the Sopwith Camel. Why was it called a camel? Well, it was called a camel because see where the two machine guns are here. It's like a little hump. So, so it's like the hump on a camel, so it's called the, the Sopwith Camel. Uh, that's a great aeroplane, and it, it's Quite maneuverable as well. Above that is a faster aeroplane. This is the SE5A. Uh, now again, this has got one machine gun firing through the propeller <coughs> and another aeroplane firing above the propeller. So the, the pilot's got a bit of difficulty in firing both of those together. Just a quick mention of uh, one of the, the great British uh, aces. This is Albert Ball. Again, a guy who, uh, who wins the Victoria Cross. Uh, he would, I, I, think he, I think he got a little bit addled after a while. He was very determined. So he would go and fly with his squadron uh, in the morning. And then he would come back and have some food. And he would then fly off on his own in a French aeroplane, a Newport 17. That's, that's the aeroplane up on the top right here is Newport. Um, and he is, he's, he's one of our, our great aces. Uh, he is lost on the 7th of May 1917 because he's engaged with uh, British aeroplanes, SE5 aeroplanes, uh, as we saw you saw a moment ago. Um, and now, uh, Frank, uh, sorry, mate, you're wiggling your cursor and uh, you're putting blue lines on the picture. So. I can clip up. Oh, oh, bother. Sorry about that. I was trying to do one thing and did another thing. I'll go get back there. Uh, right, there we go. Um, so, uh, 
Where were we? Right, okay. Um, so, uh, Albert Ball is actually shot down while he's engaged with the other pilots of Richthofen's squadron. Uh, and uh, so he was last seen pursuing an albatross flown by Richthofen's brother, Lothar. The crash site for Albert Ball isn't far from the crash site of Richthofen. Uh, I've been to see the two and it's about a half hour drive between the two. Uh, there we see uh, Mr. Mr. Manfred with his other pilots, his brother's one of those there, uh, and the dog on the bottom left, so it can't be so bad if he's got a dog. Uh, and Rick Tofen in popular culture. Uh, now James knows of my enthusiasm for Jethro Tull, I also, write, also rather like Led Zeppelin. And here's a famous photograph on the left of Rick Tofen in his aeroplane with his pilots, and you can see that Led Zeppelin borrowed that photograph and then manipulated it and put some different heads in. Uh, where are we? There we go. Um, for the, the cover of Led Zepp 2. So this is just Rick Tofen appearing in popular culture. Um, the Germans are making really good use of him um, for publicity. And uh, so he, in May 1917, he's called to have a meeting with the, the senior guys of the air service, um, Sir Hermann Thompson and Ernst von Huttner, uh, in the Imperial headquarters at Bart Kreuznach. Uh, and this, this photograph appears in his book, which is the Red Battle Flyer, uh, which was published in 1917. So they said, we need you to have a little bit of a break from flying to write this book because people want to read about you and what you're doing. Um, and, uh, and we're very grateful because it's a first-hand account of his experiences. Uh, just rather favour uh, Rick Tofen, as you can imagine. If you can write your own story, you'll come out well. Now, this is very important. This is, an, this is a key moment in Rick Tofen's life. This is where he gets a wound in the head. So, July the 6th, 1917. He was about to attack a Vickers bomber. So it's a Vickers two-seater aeroplane. He hadn't even taken the safety catch off his gun. And he's within about 300 meters of the enemy. Now he says, Rick Tofen says, the best marksman does not just does not hit the target at this distance. No one's going to going to get a hit at 300 meters. It's too far away. However, there's a, shall we say it's a lucky hit from the, the, the British aeroplane um, from the Vickers. Uh, there's a blow to his head, who is totally paralyzed and blinded. He's been hit in the head. We'll see where the hit was in a moment. He couldn't move his limbs. He could tell that he was going into a dive. He couldn't see. He was blinded. Uh, when, the, when the darkness slowly lifted, he checked his altimeter. He could see that he was about 800 meters off the ground. He dropped 3,000 meters very rapidly. He managed, manages to recover enough to get down to 50 meters, and he makes a rough landing. He realizes he's going to faint again. He's landed on the German side of the line, which is fortunate for him, and he just, he, he just collapses and he remembers that, that he fell on a thistle. So people rush out and get hold of him and look after him. He's still flying an Albatross D5 at this stage. Uh, this particular machine, not an old red one, but that's, that's not important. Really. You can see here the photograph of the damage in his flying helmet. He's been lucky to survive that shot. <clears throat> Maybe if it was three or four millimeters close to the brain, he'd have been dead. So it scraped his head. It's, it's dead. And it certainly affected him. It changed him for the rest of his life, as you would imagine. Anyone that's had um, a nasty wound to their head, it can, kind of, it can change you. <coughs> so he has to spend some time in hospital. Here he is. In Field Hospital Number 76, uh, near in Courtrai in Belgium, uh, there's that particular nurse. I, I call her Sister Kirta. I think that's how you, you say the name. Uh, I don't think there's any romance between them. Maybe there was. Don't know. Um, he's there for 20 days. He is not happy. He wants to be flying, rather like Albert Ball. If you remember, he was very keen to be back in his aeroplane. 
Rick Tofen just wants to be flying. He want, that's what he loves. He wants to be out there hunting. He wants to be <laughs> shooting down the enemy. He doesn't want to be in a hospital. Might be nice to have Kater to talk to. He'd rather be up in the clouds. What about his dog? He wants to be out there with his dog. Drink beer with his dog, with his mates. Then go flying. Then kill some British pilots. That's what he wants to do. But he's determined to go flying. And they can't really stop him. Uh, they said, you shouldn't go flying until you, your wound's completely healed, but off he goes. So this is, this is July, late July 1917. He's been badly damaged, but he's gone back to flying. And he's never quite the same thereafter. Now, there's a, a medical record, there's an article in The Lancet in 1999. Uh, was the Red Baron fit to fly? I've read the entire article, and it basically says, looking back on all the evidence available to us now, the doctor said, you shouldn't fly because you're not completely fit, but he did. And maybe he wasn't ever quite as, as capable, quite as with it, quite as on the ball as he had been before. However, at least he gets the best aeroplane available. Some would say the best aeroplane in World War One. I. I prefer the Fokker D7, but the Fokker triplane, the DR1. Uh, this is what he flies from late July 1917. But of the 80 kills credited to Richthofen, he only, he only got 19 of them from the, the triplane. So that's almost a, almost a quarter of his kills with the triplane. Beautiful little aeroplane, quite small, very manoeuvrable, and uh, it's got the twin machine guns. Actually, you could say, looks rather like the Sopwith triplane. So maybe the Sopwith triplane preceded it. And we British people do say, ah, the Germans sold our technology, use some of our best ideas. But um, I don't know enough about aeroplanes to, to know that one way or another. Um, for those of us that grew up with um, airfix aeroplanes, as I did, I remember having this dogfight double kit. So the Red Baron in his triplane and the, uh, the, the, the Fokker, that's uh, and the, the, the Bristol FE2B. And that, that image of the red triplane, you see it everywhere, don't you? I just picked a book, picked a book at random off the shelf. Death is their co pilot. What's on the front? Red Fokker triplane, of course. Why not? So we're approaching the fateful day, the fateful day, the day that, that Rick Tofen gets killed. 21st of April, 1918. He's flying over the Moroncourt Ridge near the Somme River. Uh, this location is actually quite easy to find if you know where to go. Um, 21st of April, he's, he's pursuing a pilot in the Sopwith Camel. Now, it's a Canadian pilot, Wilfred May, whose nickname was Wop. So he, he's, he's flying, he's trying to shoot down Wop May, who's fairly inexperienced. Now, May had just fired on his cousin, Wolfram, Wolf, Wolfram um, and Manfred's upset about this. So he flies to rescue his cousin. And so Wilfred, May, is, is flying away. And he pursues May across the Somme River. And he's briefly spotted and attacked by another uh, pilot, another Canadian pilot, Arthur Brown or Roy Brown, not Roy Chubby Brown, he was somewhere else. Um, and Brown had to dive steeply at very high speed to intervene and then had to climb steeply to avoid hitting the ground. So the problem here is that Richthofen has got it's what's called target fixation. He's become preoccupied with flying against Wilfred May. And he's forgetting all the advice that he gave his pilots. He said, don't fly low. Don't fly in straight lines. Don't get fixated on just one enemy pilot. You need to keep looking out because someone will crack up behind you and so on. Now, uh, in a stop with Camel, we have Captain Roy Brown. Um, and there, there's his photograph. There's a photograph of the stop with Camel. And Roy Brown claims that he shot down Rick Tofen, But he didn't. There's a lot of controversy about this. Um, and... Uh, we aren't, we aren't, you, there's whole books written about this, so if, what I'm going to try and explain in two minutes, 
you know you could read read several chapters uh, and then you can have your own opinion but uh it's pretty clear now that the the bullet that killed him was fired from the ground because um it it came in from underneath a single bullet penetrates from the right out it comes out next to the left nipple it's come from below brown's attack was from above that's not it's not a bullet from brown's machine gun that's killed him it's a machine gunner from the ground now um th there's various people who uh who <coughs> get the claim to this but um my money is with sergeant cedric popkin uh, for the australian machine gunners using a vickers gun there's there's other arguments someone says snowy evans and so on um with a lewis gun now um you might recognize that rather overweight looking smiling gentleman ha ha it's me it's me next to the interpretive panel this is the the ground near the somme um where uh, rick Tofen crashed to the ground um it's a potato field uh, it's it's full of chalk and flint it doesn't look a terribly fertile field but this is where the plane crashed to the ground and immediately people go to rush to get to the airplane and get as many souvenirs off it as possible. It gets picked clean very quickly. So here's a photograph of the wreck a few days later. Well, you can see the rotary engines kind of mostly intact, uh, but people have grabbed strips of um, strips of the canvas. So sort of strips of red canvas. I've got a strip of red canvas. It's from the red from the Rick Hofens, um Fokker triplane. I'm sure there's a lot of strips of red canvas, and maybe some of them were from the triplane um there's the uh, machine gun company with sergeant cedric popkin uh, in the photograph uh and uh, and there we have the australians feeling very pleased with themselves they've got a bit of souvenir they've got the tailplane of his triplane um there's various bits of this airplane or people claim to have various bits in this airplane throughout the world and in edmonton um in canada there's the this gentleman here holding what he's claiming is a bit of one of the spars from the wing strut <coughs> the, uh, the rotary engine uh is in duxford we're claiming that we've got that in duxford museum i think it's probably a pretty good claim um, now rick Tofen is buried uh, so there's some trivia coming up here so if we ever go to parties again you can impress people with telling them how many times Rick Tofen was buried because it's several times uh, so he's buried with full honors here we see 22nd of April he's buried in a British cemetery <coughs> we recognize that he's an honorable fella we want to give him a good burial so so they look after him uh, but then after the war in the 1920s the Germans set up a military cemetery at a place called Freecorps now, I hadn't realised that he'd been buried in Freecourt. I was driving through the Somme with a friend. We're driving slowly past this cemetery. And I say, stop the car, stop the car. I've just seen a photograph of Rick Tofen. So we stopped the car. I went, oh, his body was moved here after the war. Uh, so for a while, he was buried in this cemetery. <coughs> uh, and a, a lot of graves of German cemeteries actually have two bodies in them. Now, what happened here is that the family of the German government thought actually we should give more honor to Richthofen because he's, he's, a, he's a war hero, he's a great hero. So let's not have him buried in some odd field away in France on the Somme. Let's bring him to Berlin and let's bury him with honors at the Invalidenfriedhof in Berlin. So that's where he goes. His body is transferred there in 1925. Now, not surprisingly, the Nazis want to adopt him. There's an entire talk about how the Luftwaffe were short of practice, were short of heroes. Um, they, they, had, they were only allowed a small number of planes, so they had to make the best use they could of all the heroes from World War I, read all their books because they, they didn't have much else. And the Nazis go a bundle for Richthofen and they design a really grand tomb for him. So he's got gets a new grave, a new tomb. You can see here's a, here's a wreath on the 20th anniversary of his death with the Nazi guards and so on. 
not too sure about Rick, Rick Tobin's politics. He might not have been too keen to be so honoured by the Nazis. Um, that's, a, that's another story. Uh, however, the Invalidenfriedhof is just a, an awkward position in Berlin, right on where the Berlin Wall was. And so the, there was various moments where people were trying to escape from East Germany and uh, bullets were fired at them. And so there was bullet damage on Rick Tofen's grave. So it wasn't in a terribly good position. So the family asked if they can relocate Rick Tofen. So, so the body is moved again for the fourth time and it goes to Wiesbaden and his younger brother, Bodko, got permission. And so his body is moved in 1975. And there's the family grave with, with um, Manfred in the family grave. Now, Here's a bit of trivia, because I love a bit of trivia, particularly if there's dogs involved. <coughs> um, we've, we all think of the Red Baron as Richthofen. Uh, uh, oh, we all think of Richthofen as known as the Red Baron. But this term was, was barely used until the 1960s. Um, and there's, there's a graph, a couple of, a couple of rather interesting <coughs> articles all about the use of the name. What happens is he appears in the Snoopy, in the Peanuts cartoon, in the comic strip, <laughs> 1965. And thereafter, this really popularizes the name of the Red Baron in popular culture. So it's, it's a 1960s <laughs> thing, which I think is quite intriguing, really. Uh, and I, I love this cartoon. So I'm going to read through the cartoon very quickly for you. So here's Snoopy on his kennel. He thinks he's, he's flying a sock with camel. Um, here's the famous World War One pilot flying over Belgium. Must search out the infamous red baron. <laughs> ah, he's on my tail. He's not behind me. He's tricked me again. My plane is on fire. I've got to bail out. And by the bottom middle, curse you, red baron. He jumps off his kennel aeroplane. And Charlie Brown says, when bailing out, the average World War One fighter pilot did not land in his supper dish. And Snoopy says, how embarrassing. Love that cartoon. Now, the, the, the modern German Luftwaffe still regards Richthofen as one of the great, their great heroes. There is actually a modern German squadron, so Jagdschwader 71, uh, uh, which was their first operational jet fighter unit. And they, they are the Richthofen squadron. They continue his name. And you can see their, their airplanes here, the, the Eurofighter Typhoon. If you have a look at the tailplane there, we use the, the red marker, you see his, his image and the, the picture of the the triplane. So he's still remembered by the Luftwaffe. Uh, talk to my German friend who tells me that the German political right have tried to adopt Richthofen as well. And that's caused a, a bit of upset. So that is the end of my talk. Somehow I got through it in under 55 minutes. I'm absolutely astonished. Uh, there's his grave, which I think is an appropriate place to finish. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. And uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, I hope you found that entertaining. I hope there were enough dogs in it for you. Tim, thank you very much indeed for that. I mean, if everybody wants to unmute themselves and ask some questions, um, if I may, I'll kick off. Please. Um, what was Richthofen's view of Goering? Because they were in the same uh, um, flying circus together, weren't they? Right. That's very, I'd love to know, I'd love to give you a good answer on that. Um, I have an opinion of Goering, and you can imagine it's not very flattering. Um, I, I wonder how well they, they knew one another. I think Goering really kind of developed as a fighter pilot after Richthofen had died. So Manfred might not have known him that well, and it was, oh, okay. it was his brother who knew him better. Um, I'm a Mancunian, so I, oh, there's a young lad here, so I can't use the word that I was going to use, but uh, uh, pompous gentleman, rather full of his own importance. Um, and I, I think he was like that in World War I as well as World War II. Uh, so I, I, I think Goering really had a kind of higher opinion of himself than, than, was, than was justified. Um, I'm just looking at Gareth, because Gareth's read a few books on, on World War One. <coughs> Gareth, do you have any insight on that one? 
Uh, no, no, not oh. not my uh, particular area. I, I must admit, I'd, I'd love to know the answer to it. I must admit, but yeah, not not right. something I know. Right. I, um, I shall I shall have a read. Matt, if you want to un un unmute yourself, I'm, I know Sam's got some questions. Oh. Got to unmute yourself. You're still on mute, so we can't hear you. That's it. Hello, everybody. This is Sam. Hi. Hello, Sam. Glad you could join us. Yeah, go, go for it. Why was he? Why was the Red Baron so greedy and unrespectful, though his enemies respected him as a good pilot? Well, was he disrespectful? His well, job. His job was to shoot down the enemy. Which is, is kind of rather disrespectful, but that's your job. Um, well, so, so me and Sam had a conversation about this. Yeah. So the British chap that won the Victoria Cross. Yeah. You know, if they're if if they're having as gentleman pilots, right. which you're portraying the, the Baron von Richthofen as being. Yes. Yeah. You know, they were in an aerial dogfight, yeah. and this chap run out of petrol. Yeah. And they was having a fight, and then he he still followed him and shot him down. Right. Well, that doesn't sound very gentlemanly to us, does it, Sam? That that's a that's a fair point. Um, and yeah. you know, we can't we can't say that this chap was a gentleman. Yeah. You know, can well, we? You know, and you show pictures of him stood there with his dog, <laughs> you know, with the nurse portraying yeah. him as this. You know, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm yeah. a jolly chap. When actually, he was probably a cold bloody killer. Um, well, uh, I, I, Which I'd, they like, all to, were, I'd like to just refer you to my, my second and third slides. He was a cold-blooded killer. He was a cold-blooded, but, but, but that's what he was. in the other slide, yeah. you portrayed yeah. him as a gentleman, when well, actually he, right. he followed another guy that ran out of petrol, the British Victorian Cross winner, and shot him down, which yeah. wasn't cricket. <laughs> it's not cricket, but he's not English. Was it? He's, not, he's Prussian and he's a hunter. Well, you know, and, and the he, other, he, the other. Listen, we, we all know what war is, and we will yeah. take people down. But that yeah. wasn't cricket, was it, sir? Well, yeah, but did you, he, did you even pulled that up, didn't you? You <laughs> pulled that up. Didn't you? <laughs> but I, Matthew, I, Sam, I, did he? Cricket. Did he know that he was the, the guy was running out of petrol? Well, I don't know, James, but in those well, days, I, I could imagine in those planes that would he, have been going. He, he would, he would have, he would have known that. Uh, yeah, if, been if Hawker there. had enough petrol, Hawker would have kept circling oh, okay. and manoeuvring and so on. So, so right. by, by the action That's of heading right. for home what's, and heading directly to home. And he's got his daughter. Um, hold on. Sam actually wrote that down. That wasn't very respectful of him to Chase when he was running for <laughs> <all> petrol. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's, there's some fascinating incidents here when you read about the air war. Of of where one pilot one pilot on one side shoots down one from the other, and and they so these guys are going to be prisoner of war, but what the pilots say uh, I know I know German pilots did and I'm sure British pilots did as well is, is they would say right okay I've shot this guy down I'm taking him prisoner tomorrow I've got to hand him over to the authorities but for tonight he's coming to the mess at my squadron we're going to have dinner he's going to be guest of honour. Uh, he'll have as much beer as he wants. He'll have the nicest food we can we can offer him. Tomorrow he's going to be a prisoner of war, but tonight he was um, tonight <coughs> he will be my prisoner and, and my my guest. Now I see this question here from Fiona. Uh, what area of northern France did he fly in, please? Well, uh, in northern France he's mostly in the kind of Flanders area, the Ypres area, and so on. Uh, there, there are various books you can get um, of uh, you, you can you can just do a tour of the various battlefields that he flew from. So you can do a kind of rather nice little circle. Um, but as, as I said in the talk, he never actually flew south into the um, into the French sector once he'd got started. So he had flown over Verdun. So he had flown against the French. But when he starts his career as a combat pilot, he's only ever in the British area, so that, that's Flanders and Ypres and the Somme and so on. I've Thank got you. another question, um, uh, uh, Tim. Yeah. This is from Michael. All right. Uh, 
His house was in East Germany. What is the yes. state of his house now? And a very good question. And the artifacts that were in the house? Yes, yes. OK, right. Um, Five minutes. That's, that's very interesting. Um, they, oh. the, the, the house is now located in modern day Poland. And for a period, it was part of the East Germany and therefore the Soviet zone. And so I think the story is that a lot of what was in his mum's house uh, was then kind of disappeared during the Cold War. So although the Germans would have loved to have had it in a museum in Berlin, and maybe, maybe the Germans missed a trick here. Uh, maybe if the Germans had taken you know, like all his um, silver trophies and put them somewhere safe in a museum in Berlin and then put them somewhere safe when the RAF and the, the Americans were bombing, maybe they'd have survived. But I think a lot of, of his trophies have disappeared. Um, I'm not too sure of the, the state of the house now. So it was somewhere in Poland. Maybe the Polish tourist authority at some stage will say, oh, um, uh, maybe maybe we people will want to visit it and, um, uh, and and we can we can turn this into a tourist attraction. Now I can see that there's another question here from Sam. Why was it nicknamed the Flying Circus? I know the answer to this. Ah, I know the answer. It was called the Flying Circus because for quite a period they were moving from airfield to airfield. And one reason to move from one airfield to another is because the British keep coming over and dropping bombs on your airfield. And if there's big holes in your runway, um, <coughs> you can either try and fix that or you can develop another runway somewhere else and the British have got to find that and drop bombs there. And so for a period, they were moving around like a travelling circus with lots of tents. And they were painting their, their aeroplanes any which colour. They were arguably the most colourful squadron in the German air, air, <laughs> in the German air service. Um, and so that's, they, they, were, they were certainly the very colourful ones. So hence, Flying Circus and so on. Those of us as, of a, an older age will know about Monty Python's Flying Circus, but that's something completely different. Or oh, quite pleased with that one. <laughs> um, so uh, Andy Mullen says, I lived once in the village of village where the no hawker, Victoria Cross came from Long Parish, Hampshire, went to his family home at the time of World War I. Still there, wonderful. I should put that on my list of places to visit when we're able to. That's great stuff. So, more questions, but for another five minutes plus. Right. <coughs> Fiona, I think you had a, a, another question. I, I think I interrupted you. No? Andy, have you got any questions? No? Oh. <laughs> Come on, Sam. We're going to unmute Matt and we're going to have another question from Sam. I hope, I hope it's nothing about being a gentleman. You've got to unmute yourself, Sam. Still maybe he's I think you might be typing the question. Oh, that would just, that would just read it out. Oh. Sorry, we were, we were typing, yeah. but Sam, yeah. Sam wants to ask. Yeah, okay. it's even nicer. Was his... The name of his squadron like actually called Jester 11 or something like yeah that. so so the German now you, you possibly guess that I'm a German speaker from the way I've been pronouncing things so Jagd Schwader there we go boy German Jagd Schwader uh, Jagd is it means hunt so uh Jäger uh, is a brand of very expensive clothes for ladies it also means hunter so that's the original name Hunter. Same with the French Chasseur. Um, and so uh, a Schwader is a squadron. So Jagd Schwader is the full name. And they then reduce that to, to, to Jaster because you, know, you spend all your life saying Jagd Schwader. It's a lot quicker to say Jaster. That's where that comes from. But it, that was invented in World War One. Well, you know, aeroplanes were invented shortly before World War One. And I, I think I showed you on the pictures, didn't it wasn't amazing how aeroplanes developed from, from so much canvas and, and wooden struts and so on, and you'd been very brave to fly in them, through to those beautiful aeroplanes. Yeah, yeah, fuck a triplane, it's a beautiful aeroplane. 
what the fuck are D7s be doing? Fucker, uh, they, they, they stop with Camel, beautiful aeroplane. Uh, uh, and so on. So, it, oh, here we go. Right. Oh, Gareth. Oh, do you think the idolization of pilots like the Red Baron contributed to Germany being too fighter focused in World War II? Oh, oh dear. That's a. Well, were the Germans too, fo too fighter focused? That's very interesting. Um, what a good question. Uh, certainly that the Luftwaffe had had a very rough time between the wars because the Treaty of Versailles said you can't have an air force. It took them a long while. And there was actually a, there was a training group in Russia called the Black Luftwaffe. But actually I read about that and, and they didn't actually train those many. Uh, so, yes, <laughs> uh, there's, let's call it, let's say there's the legend of the uh, Best fit 109 pilots and if you want to get two world war ii air enthusiasts all excited you'll 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 pick one of them and say yeah no the messerschmitt was a better airplane than the spitfire and the other one will get very excited oh the spitfire is better they were very closely matched and so if you knew if you were flying one and you knew where the limitations were of the other so it's like one of them could climb better the other one could turn better and so you could um oh andy mullen's going to show us an Ulan helmet. Oh, brilliant. Oh, wow. Brilliant. Wow. Now, it, it, <laughs> the Ulan, that is, that's a Polish thing. So the Polish lancers prior to the Napoleonic Wars, that particular style with the diamond shape on the top is known as Shapska. And uh, Napoleon had several lancers in his army wearing, wearing that. And after the Napoleonic Wars, the British army decided they wanted lancers in their army and they had them wearing those same hats like that and the charge of the light brigade involved lancers wearing shapska hats like that thank you for sharing andy that's great good stuff jolly good uh what what, what actually was global's war record asks matt whoa um is that goering or gables ah Sorry, I apologise. I was typing. It was Goering. Ah, right. I think you mean Goering, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you don't you don't want to hear my opinions about Goebbels. No, there's, a there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a boy present. <laughs> Goebbels was not a military man. Um, no, the Luftwaffe. True. Yeah. So, um, so with the German Air Service, I, I, I'm, I'm saying German Air Service because I struggle with the German. It's Kriegstreit something. Um, the... Uh, so Goring's war record, not brilliant. He was he was fortunate to be in a in one of the leading squadrons. So you don't get there without being unless you've got some level of competence. Mm -hmm. But I put it to you that the anything that Go, that Goring wrote about his war service would emphasise all the positives and skate over the negatives. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, kind of, if I'm, if I'm looking for something positive here, at least he had good taste in art, or at least he knew what would be valuable and where it could be stolen and then stashed away. So as an art enthusiast myself, I'm, I'm trying to find something positive about, about Goering. No, um, no, because we, we was always, you know, because whenever he was, you know, yeah. the, the propaganda machine was always said yeah. that he, he was, he was a, a fighter ace, wasn't he, in the, in the Great War? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Similar to Rick Toff and, and... I'm going to throw in, I'm going to throw in a complete bit of trivia here. The, did you know that raccoons in Europe were introduced? Well, the, I, I've read this, it's on the internet, so it must be true. Raccoons were introduced during uh, the 1930s by the German Nature Service to please Goering because he, he was a, he liked to go hunting and he wanted something different to shoot at. So they introduced six pairs of raccoons into the forests in Germany so that Goering would have something different to shoot at. And of course, when you start introducing breeding pairs of animals, they start breeding. And so they've spread from Germany, they spread through the mainland, they spread through Holland, France. The, the, the last time I heard of, heard of them, they got as far as Kent. So if you see raccoons in Kent, so look out for them in, in the southeast of England. Um, these <laughs> these have been let out into the wild by Nazis. So I found that on the internet, so it must be true. 
Where are we going? So, there we go. Right, any more questions? Trevor, have you got anything? Sarah? Me? I love seeing lots of smiling faces. This is very encouraging. As long as somebody enjoys I, it. I just Hello, wanted Sarah. to Actually, I did want to ask, yeah. but you've answered yeah. it already about all these silver cups, but do you think yeah. they're all or they've just disappeared? Um, I, I'm wondering how cynical an answer I can give to you. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded of going to Hitler's uh, mountain lair, uh, is it Bersh uh, well, the Bershter's garden and then the, the eagle's nest. And soldiers are very keen on getting souvenirs. And yep. so mum's house in Poland will have been in the sector occupied by the East German army on the Soviet army. And um, once soldiers see that there's an opportunity to get some loot, uh, it's amazing what could disappear very quickly. Yeah. So I think there's possibly 60 odd silver cups somewhere around Eastern Europe or whatever. Um, yeah, but, but say, say, say you're a, a, a very wealthy English war enthusiast who collects militaria and you, you get an email from someone in Poland who says, got a silver cup here. <laughs> it's, it's ripped open his 40th. I actually have a, a, a quick story here. A friend of mine went over to, to Poland to see a friend who was living there. And his friend said, um, come, come visit the antique shop with me. There's some really interesting stuff. And so they go into the shop. So Andy's there with his friend. And they, they, they see the guy. And there's another customer in the shop. And, um, and the friend says to the shopkeeper, hello, I brought Andy here. He's come from Manchester. So he's very interested in World War II and so on. So we'd like to see what you've got. And, and he said, oh, yeah, we've got some medals here and so on. And we've got a couple of helmets here. Anyway, and then the other customer leaves the shop. And the friend goes to the, the shopkeeper and says, right, can we go in the back now? Now there's no one else in the shop. Can we see the, the really interesting stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're a special customer. You know about the back. So they open a curtain and they go into the back room and they've got SS stuff. They've got really nasty stuff. They've got some nasty daggers and so on. You'd have a job getting that home through customs and so on. They had some very interesting stuff for sale in a shop in Poland. And this is what, 19, 19 uh, uh, early 2000. Um, I suspect that Hitler's, I'm, I'm sorry, Richthofen's silver cups have probably gone that way. So that- Do you think, um, do you think other British pilots sort of had any sort of souvenirs? I only asked that because, oh, yeah. because oh. Um, I had a, we had a friend, a German um, yeah. military officer, and he was very keen on shooting roe deer. And every yeah. roe deer he shot, yeah. he mounted with a plaque of where it was and when it was shot. And it was all around his dining room. They had about three layers going all the way around. And it seems to be a sort of very Germanic thing to have these sort of trophies so everybody sees them. I don't know whether, I don't think the British did quite the same sort of, uh, uh. or quite. Like that, are they? I don't know. You well, might I, I, one there on the wall, but not. Sort of James, James can grumble at me later for being for being gender specific. I think it's a bit of a blokey thing. Uh, you know, my, my dad it, played five a side football. Was very proud of all the trophies he got from five a side football. Um, you know, maybe ladies do this as well. Uh, but you know, we like to have some memory of our achievements and so yeah. on. Um, you know, uh, certificates that you earn for whatever. I've got them framed on the wall in the hallway and so on, uh, yeah. so visitors can see them. Um, Maybe. Yeah, so, yeah. It's just numbers that are so great for him. And, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, the, the other thing, of course, is that if you want to collect the serial number from an aeroplane that's, that's fallen out of the ground, it really helps if it's fallen into your territory. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because, yes. yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't imagine, well, yeah, Albert Ball going, going to the German front line and saying, Excuse me, old chaps. Knocked down the albatross yesterday. Um, it, it's kind of a couple of miles that way. Do you, do you mind if I go through and collect it? Oh, would you like to be prisoner of war and stay stay behind barbed wire for the rest of the war? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you can only do it 
and no. a lot of World War One air fighting was actually over the British lines. Yeah. Um, again, that's very simplistic. Uh, I see there's a question here from Fiona, which is an interesting one. Are many of the original airfields from World War One in northern France uh, still available to visit? So the British ones and the French ones. Not so many. Um, certainly, I've got books on the shelf of uh, airfields in Britain <coughs> from World War II, um, which, of, which of them can you still see? Um, very often they're, they're in positions where the farmers want the land, or you could put a big housing estate on there. Um, mm. There's a huge uh, Cold War airbase north of Oxford called Upper Hayford. Uh, where, where F-111s flew in the, in the Q8 war, I think it was. Um, and that's now a brownfield site. Some of it is still airfield, but a lot of it is, is turning into housing. Um, likewise, throughout Europe, throughout Northern Europe, there are some airfields. Um, some are just open fields. I, I think very few are preserved. Um, I know reading through the Richthofen book, um, there was... There's one particular one where there is still a shed. So if you get in touch with the, the gentleman who owns the, the farm, um, <laughs> you can go on the right day and catch him at home and say, can I see your shed, please? Yeah. And they've got an original shed as, as used by the Germans in World War One. But on these the same... things are disappearing. Yeah. Fiona? Sorry. Just on the same line as my question, you, you yeah. can see I'm getting a bit on, on a bit one tracked, maybe, yeah, and sorry. off your topic. But would you recommend, please, any book or any guide I can find to where these remaining Ooh. airfields are in northern France? Right. Um, bear with me. I don't know if this is of interest to other people, so I'm being a bit there selfish here. No, 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 not at all. Because uh, I have a mission to visit some of them you, myself. You have a mission, right? Okay. Back my grandfather if I can. Oh, Battleground Europe. So there we go, Battleground Europe. So there's the brand name there. So right down Battleground Europe. Yes. And there's at least three. Mm. This one is Airfields and Airmen in Ypres, or Ypres, or Wipers. As Wipers, the call yes. it. Wipers. There is also. Uh, I'm just looking up here. There's Channel Coast. There's Arras, and uh, I think there might just be those three. Thank you. From that. Um, oops, hey. Uh, there oh, there's, there's Channel Coast. Mm -hmm. There's Channel Coast. There's uh, Arras. There mm. is another one specific to Richthofen. Oh, right. Which is... Uh, a whole book for him. Which is... Hang on. Hang on. Oh! You'd think my books were organised. It's not true. In the footsteps of uh, that's Battleground Europe. Same well. series, yeah. They do, they do some brilliant books, yeah. Thank you. And, and there's there's my notes writing down all eighty of his kills, <laughs> trying to get some sense as to what aeroplanes he shot down. And, and Thank stuff. you. As Gareth has pointed out, you can go to Croydon and see the old uh, airport oh, there. Yeah. Uh, just to give a. Uh, a bit of a plug for ourselves. We do a tour, yeah. the RAF and the RFC tour, um, uh, which actually we, we visit where Ball, um, Rick Toven, and um, a friend of mine who's a uh, great uncle, uh, his name is Tim McCudden Hughes. Uh, McCudden, you've probably heard of, Jim yes. McCudden. Um, so we go to where he, uh, he sadly died as well so we, we do the thing the only airfield which uh, is sort of original kind of air, uh, first world war airfield strangely enough is in Essex um, oh. which we do visit um, so uh, you know if you, if you are interested in uh, this this part of history I believe we're the only tour which cover the RAF and RFC uh, the Royal Flying Corps before it became the RAF um, we do a bit of uh, on the tour. We do a bit of German stuff. Um, the tour lead, uh, the tour guide, actually isn't Tim. It's a, a squadron leader, a guy called uh, Andrew White, um, and we will be doing that um, this year. Uh, I've forgotten the date. You'll have to go on the, the website 
but it's um it's a fantastic tour and uh, extremely interesting but as fiona's pointed out there isn't much to see in france i mean you can yeah. visit the yeah. crest sites but the airfields are now all plowed up they're, you know they're farmland um, but by visiting cemeteries and, and getting a good guide, he, he can bring all this to, to life again. Um, it's 20 past nine, uh, sorry, 20 past seven even. Um, I think I'm going to wrap this all up unless anybody else has got any major questions. Uh, Tim, I just, very good talk by the way. Tim, I just got a, a very quick question on the, on the Blue Max medal. Why was it called uh, Paul Le Merite? Why was it a French name on a? That's a very good question, and I and I remember reading the detail, and I've, I'm struggling to remember. Um, I think it's I'm, I'm going to say it's in the same way as a lot of our heraldry uses Latin or Greek or whatever. Mm. Um, so look, Paul Le Merite, it's I think it goes back to the mid 19th century. That particular honor because of course the germans had the the iron cross the iron cross goes quite a way back and the, the shape of the iron cross the, the maltese cross is a very old german military symbol and so paul paul and Marais, uh, have a look on wikipedia <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, yeah it, it well, and it sounds good doesn't it you know kind of, it does if it you does. want if you want to impress people you use a bit of foreign <laughs> And so on in the right place. But, and, yeah. and do you know, just uh, just carrying on that theme, do you know how many uh, Blue Maxes were awarded in the First World War? Oh, not a huge number. They were very hard to get early on. Um, so uh, I think, was it Bilker and, and Richthofen were kind of vying with one another to get the, bl the Blue Max. So Immelman had got one. Um, Richthofen and Bilker, I think they they got on like within a week of one another, but not not many. Uh, off the top of my head, maybe between twenty and thirty in the German air, air service. If those many, I could be completely wrong. You can look yeah. on Wikipedia and say hundred, and you think, what does Tim Cockett know? How yeah. many books has Tim Cockett read with very few pictures in? Because as far as I'm aware, our award of, uh, uh, we gave quite a few VCs out in the First World War for the yeah. number of aircraft downed by yeah. our, uh, Royal Flying Corps pilots. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, whereas that emphasis was changed in the Second World War for the award of a VC, wasn't it? Because very few aircrew got VCs in the Second World War. Fighter pilots, very few got VCs in yeah. the Second World yeah, War. Yeah. Of course, yeah, if you've got a valuable medal, you, know, you need to be very careful about giving it out because if you just start handing them out willy nilly, mm. then you know it kind of degrades the value of it. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, Rock's Drift is another interest of mine. They gave out lots of VCs at Rock's Drift. Maybe that was because we'd had a very embarrassing moment the same day with the Zulus overrunning the British. It doesn't yeah, I mean, Rock's Drift was more political than anything else, wasn't it? Well, precisely, yes, <coughs> yeah. Let, let, let's let's uh. Let, let's not have the British people upset over their breakfast reading about some horrible defeat by, yeah. by the locals. We're, we're going into a different conversation now, chaps. We are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're talking about Victorian spin doctrine, and that's, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. That's well, I, I can remember watching the film The Blue Max in the yes. cinema, yeah. and uh, I still haven't recovered from watching uh, Ursula Andrus. So. Uh... <laughs> Absolutely. Sam, you should watch the film. It's good for your education. It's a good film. It's good. For... <laughs> uh, James, I'm going to ask, who's on next? Who have you got for February? Uh, well, we've we, we got, we got a good line. Well, the next one, actually, is the capture of Detroit uh, by the British uh, in 1812. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. And that's uh, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Jonathan Riley. Um, We've got the life, life and loves of Lord Nelson by Felicity. Um, we, we've got uh, the Battle of Ottoman, uh, Otterburn, sorry, Otterburn, yes, Otterburn oh, right. by uh, John Sadler. We've really? got um, no, as I said, we're up until March. We're, we're sort of fully booked. 
Mm. And um, at the end of March, I'll stop it and then restart it again, so probably in October, when the clocks go backwards or forward to whatever they do. But um, all I would say is thank you very much indeed, all of you, for tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed the talk. Uh, we do record these talks, so if you do want to watch them again or indeed watch any other talk, do let me know and I'll send you the link. Uh, the, the link is to YouTube. It's all by invitation only, but I'm very happy to share any talk with you, past talks, so you can see what, uh, what we've been up to. There's been some brilliant talks. Um, Jonathan Marcus, who's a personal friend of mine, talking about the history of, of journalism in warfare. He mm. was the BBC World Cor uh, Defence Correspondent, uh, World Service Defence Correspondent. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a whole range of various talks. You know, if, if there's something you would like, uh, do, do let me know and I'll, I'll, send, you, I'll send you the link. Um, but again, thank you all very much. Have a, have a great weekend and hopefully I'll see you at the next talk. Tim, thank you for your talk. That was very, well, very good. Thank Bye, you, Julia. Tim. Bless you. Thank All you, right. people. Keep Take safe. Care. God bless. Bye. Bye. Bye.